In this video, we'll demonstrate how to edit an access point configuration in the Ruckus One Network Management Platform. Please note that this is a how-to video and not a why-to video, meaning it's not intended to provide deep dive information on every setting. Visit the ruckusnetworks.com website to find training curricula as well as access to Ruckus Technical Family content which also includes best practices and deployment guides. As you may recall, when you initially add an access point, or AP, to Ruckus One, you have to assign it to a venue. Well, the venue's Wi-Fi configuration settings are automatically applied to the AP during the AP's onboarding process. But many of those settings can be customized per access point, which is handy if you need to modify settings to improve coverage, throughput, or user experience. Ruckus One makes it easy to reconfigure settings on a specific AP. Your list of access points is only one click away. It's accessible from the Devices tile on the dashboard. Just click the number at the end of the access points entry. Or via the UI main menu, hovering over Wi-Fi, clicking on Access Point List. Now, in your list of APs, note that clicking the tick box for an AP reveals edit, delete, reboot, and download log functions. These same functions are available on the APs page using the configure button to edit settings and the more actions drop down list for other actions. And don't worry, reboot and delete actions require a confirmation, so these actions cannot be performed by a single errant click. By going through the APs page, you get the added benefit of being able to place the AP on a floor plan, or view the APs data and metrics, which are useful if you need extra information to help you determine what the new configuration settings should be. For example, changing radio settings. But if your task is straightforward and you need no additional information, for example, you're just changing the IP setting from dynamic to static, or disabling a specific LAN port, or disabling multicast traffic. Then the tick box edit process is the most efficient. The AP details tab reflects the information defined when the AP was initially added. So you're looking at venue name, AP name, and serial number, and GPS coordinates, which are based on the venue address. All fields can be modified except for the serial number, which is linked to the physical AP. Note that AP group is selectable only if an AP group has already been created and assigned to the associated venue. If the venue has no defined AP groups, then this field will be grayed out. And yes, even the GPS coordinates, which are simply based on the address defined for the venue, can be changed by dragging and dropping the red pin on the map you will be asked to confirm any GPS change. A couple scenarios for this are an AP that's deployed in a large sprawling building or in a tunnel where there's no reliable GPS signal to provide the coordinates. If your only changes are to the AP details screen, then click the apply button to save and apply your changes. A green confirmation box will appear in the lower right corner Thereafter, you can click the Back to Device Details button to exit the configuration mode and go back to the AP-specific page. Let's step back a moment in time. You've made changes on the AP Details tab, but have not yet applied them. Now, you decide that you want to edit something on the Settings tab. If you've made at least one change on this screen, even if you change it back to the original value, and then you click another tab, you'll be prompted to save or discard your changes. After making your selection on the pop-up, you're taken to the Settings tab. The Settings screen consists of tabs pertaining to general IP, radio, LAN port, and applicable service settings. On the General tab, you can change the IP settings from the default setting of Dynamic to Static. 
A static IP address may be preferable in cases where you have several APs at a venue and you want their IP addresses to follow a specific pattern instead of being dynamically assigned from a DHCP pool. If you select static, then you must provide an IPv4 static IP address, a network mask address, a gateway address, and a primary DNS address. On the radio tab, you can modify the Wi-Fi radio settings per radio band. These are the same radio settings that you saw when adding or configuring your venue. So you may remember that each radio band and each channel selection method has its own subset of settings. You're shown whether venue-based settings or custom settings are currently being used, and you can toggle between using customized settings and using the venue settings with just one click. Here, you can enable and disable each radio individually, which is handy when you want to provide access on a specific radio band. Note that if you have a tri-band AP, you have three radios that you can configure, the first being 2.4 GHz radio. The second and third radios can be configured for the 5 and 6 GHz bands, or you can choose to not utilize the 6 GHz band and instead split the 5 GHz band into lower and upper bands across the second and third radios. Why would you disable 6 GHz spectrum access? Well, 6 GHz isn't supported in all countries, and most environments don't have 6 GHz clients just yet. So rather than waste that third radio, you can let it service the upper and lower 5 GHz spectrum. And when the time is right, you can turn 6 GHz on to support your environment. If you're trying to optimize performance and spectrum utilization, the channel selection method can be modified. Keep in mind that whenever a channel changes, all clients connected on that channel may get dropped. Both channel fly and background scanning continuously check the other channels in the band, looking for the lowest neighbor count, the highest capacity, among other things. Background scanning is the default channel selection method for 2 and 5 GHz radios because it causes the least amount of network disruption while still attempting to optimize network performance. It estimates the impact of interference on Wi-Fi capacity, then uses a risk-reward algorithm to decide if the number of potentially impacted clients is small enough to make it worthwhile to change to a less busy channel. ChannelFly does not perform a risk-reward analysis. If it finds a better channel, it changes, regardless of the number of connected clients. If you're getting too many channel changes, or perhaps too many clients complaining about disconnects, the ChannelFly channel change frequency slider can be moved from its default setting of 33% down closer to 1% to reduce the number of channel changes. ChannelFly is the default channel selection method for the 6 GHz radio. Then there's the manual channel selection option. Available only on a per AP basis, meaning it's not available at the venue level, this option forces you to select only one channel for the radio band. If interference with other devices occurs, the network does not self-heal by automatically changing the channel. Moving on, bandwidth and transmit power adjustment fields can also be modified on a per AP basis. Bandwidth defaults to auto for each radio band. Bandwidth is the channel width used during transmission. Keep in mind that the higher the bandwidth, the more channels being used, which could lead to some channel contention. Transmit power adjustment can also be changed from full to min, including values in between, as well as auto. Keep in mind that the radio's transmit power affects its wireless coverage area and maximum achievable signal to noise ratio. If set to auto, the radio power is automatically reduced to about half to optimize coverage whenever interference is present. But this can lead to suboptimal AP power levels and is not really recommended. Ruckus recommends running AP radios at full power, the default setting, to maximize the throughput and signal-to-noise ratio levels, thereby maximizing data rates and performance. The channel selection shows which channels are enabled, 
meaning available for broadcasting. And if you selected the manual channel selection methods, here is where you'd select the one channel that will broadcast. For the other channel selection methods, the default is that all the channels broadcast. But here you can disable specific channels, which is handy if you know that there is a specific channel that will cause interference. When you're done with the settings on this tab, you can click the Apply Radio button to apply the settings to this AP, or you can cancel. Moving on to the LAN port tab, again, you're shown whether venue-based settings or custom settings are being used, and you can toggle between using customized settings and using the venue settings with just one click. A couple things to notice here. First, that the choice of custom versus venue-based will impact which fields can be modified. Second, the LAN labels on the image at the bottom of the screen correspond to the LAN tabs on this screen. You can enable or disable each port individually, but Ruckus One ensures that the PoE trunk port cannot be disabled. Port type configures the VLAN tag usage for the port, either access, general, or trunk. Choice of port type further impacts which VLAN fields can be modified. Trunk ports forward and receive tagged and untagged frames, which are used for bridging switch ports together. The trunk port is a member of all VLANs that exist on the switch, and all VLAN tagged traffic arriving on the port is seen. Access ports are used to provide network access. Traffic arriving on different access ports can be segmented into different logical networks, VLANs, using the VLAN untag ID field. Access ports are members of only one VLAN, so notice that if you change the native untagged VLAN ID field, then the VLAN member field automatically changes to match. The general port can be configured to support one native or untagged VLAN and one or more VLANs. And again, these settings are customizable on each of the AP's LAN ports. Additional services related tabs may also be seen, such as MDNS proxy, AP SNMP, and directed multicast. The MDNS proxy service is used to define how Layer 2 services are discovered, such as Bonjour services related to Apple iOS devices and IoT devices. A good example is allowing a smartphone that's connected to a specific AP to access an AirPrint printer. You must have already defined the MDNS proxy service, which is accessible via the Network Control Main Menu option. AP SNMP, when enabled, requires an SNMP agent be selected or added if none have been defined yet. An SNMP agent provides external notification to the network administrators. Configuring the SNMP agent allows proactive monitoring of devices on a network. SNMP agents are defined in the Policies and Profiles portion of Network Control. When you define an SNMP agent profile, both SNMP v2 and SNMP v3 are supported. If security is a concern, SNMP v3 is recommended due to its added support for authenticated and encrypted communications. Directed multicast can be disabled or enabled separately for wired client, wireless client, and network traffic. It's enabled by default and converts multicast traffic to unicast packets, thereby cutting down on multicast flooding and enhancing their performance in wireless networks. The wired client option controls multicast to unicast conversion from wired clients on a non-trunk interface. The wireless client option controls multicast to unicast conversion from wireless clients and the network option controls multicast to unicast conversion from wired clients on a trunk interface. And when you're finished, 
click the Apply Directed Multicast button to save and apply these changes on the access point. Lastly, click the Back to Device Details button to exit configuration mode and return to this access points page. And that brings us to the end of this video on modifying an access point configuration in the Ruckus One Network Management Platform.